Thank you, Ranking Member Scalise and members of the Select Committee for joining us today. This briefing will examine the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on essential frontline workers and the steps the federal government can take to better protect these workers. The coronavirus pandemic has already killed more than 90,000 Americans, more deaths than any other nation. Throughout this crisis, our nation's essential workers have continued to serve their communities at great potential risk to themselves and their families. They are the true heroes of this crisis. I am deeply honored that several of these heroes have joined us today. These heroes treat patients who are sick with the virus and confront the families of those who have lost loved ones. They respond to emergency calls and keep our communities safe. They stock our grocery and drugstore shelves. They keep our transit systems running and they clean our hospitals and offices to protect, present the virus from spreading further. Tens of thousands of essential workers have been infected with the virus and many have lost their lives. I am particularly concerned that many essential workers still lack basic protections that are needed to keep them and their families safe and healthy. That must change. It is unacceptable for four months into this public health crisis uh, that many uh, frontline medical professionals and other essential workers still face shortages of critical supplies like masks and hospital gowns. These shortages must be acknowledged and immediate steps must be taken to procure and distribute these necessary supplies. At last week's briefing, this subcommittee heard from two former FDA directors and other bipartisan public health experts who warned that safely reopening our economy requires a comprehensive nationwide strategy for testing, tracing, isolation, and treatment. Protections for essential workers must be a cornerstone of that strategy. Otherwise, these workers will be just uh, uh, will be put at an even greater risk as states begin to reopen and we all face a greater risk of a second wave. Essential workers across the United States have incalculable sacrifices to serve their communities during these dark times. We owe them our thanks and much more. We must provide them the protections they need the financial support and paid leave they deserve, and the clear public health guidance that is critical to prevent further harm. Today, we will hear the stories of some of these workers. We will hear from Leilani Jordan, a 27-year-old Lago, Maryland, who continued to work at a grocery store during the pandemic in order to serve her neighbors and community. She passed away due to the coronavirus. We are honored to be joined today by Ms. Jordan's mother, Zenobia Shepard. We'll also hear the story of Jason Hargrove, a bus driver from Detroit who died from the coronavirus. And we are honored to have Mr. Hargrove's friend and fellow bus driver, Eric Coates, with us today. The committee will hear today about the stress and anguish faced by essential workers who fear spreading the virus to loved ones and have been forced to isolate themselves from their children and their families. We will also hear about the financial stress that forced many low-income Americans to keep showing up to work despite the risk. 
And we will hear from first responders who battled the pandemic at the peak of the crisis in some of the hardest hit areas of the country, including New York City. These cities and states have been literally begging the federal government for months to provide more resources to protect these workers, and many are still waiting. Today's witnesses have agreed to share their stories with us, including the incredible painful loss of their family members and friends. I hope we can honor their loved ones and ease their suffering by conducting today's proceedings in a truly bipartisan manner. I hope we can find out about their needs and how we can fulfill them. Uh, I would like to introduce the essential workers and their family members who are with us today. Eric Coates is a bus driver with the Detroit Department of Transportation who I mentioned earlier. Mr. Coates, you and I recognize. Good afternoon, members of the committee. I first want to say thank you for allowing me to testify in front of you today. Um, I'm going to actually try to give you a little bit of insight into what it's like to be an essential worker since the onset of this coronavirus. I am a bus driver for the city of Detroit Department of Transportation. I've been on the job for about four years now. I'm a member and proudly member of the Amalgamated Transit Union Local 26. And on behalf of all the transit workers in Detroit and across America who are on the front lines right now, putting their own lives at risk, I appreciate the opportunity to give you some insight into the day in life of a bus driver in the middle of this pandemic. I'm also here today on behalf of bus drivers who can no longer speak, like my best friend, Jason Hargrove. Jason was not only a bus driver, Jason was a loving husband, a loving father to six wonderful children and three grandchildren. Jason on March 21st posted a Facebook Live video that has since gone viral talking about the fact of a woman in the middle of this pandemic just stood up in the back of his bus and openly coughed several times. And in doing that, it somewhat got him infected to the point that Jason, 10 days later on March 31st, died from the coronavirus. And in that, Jason was in the hospital alone. And just the pain of knowing that he had no one around him is what's really hurting his family and myself also, and is also his fellow coworkers. Jason was very, very loved with the DDOT organization. He was trying to do things to make sure that this city moved and moved freely like it's always supposed to. But driving a bus in Detroit has always been a tough job, even before the coronavirus. I know this for a fact because I know personally drivers that has been actually driving the bus and while the bus is in motion, They've been pulled out of the seat and actually attacked. People don't like paying fares or being told about regulations and they get angry about the service. So they often take out their frustrations on the drivers. ATU members across ATU members all across the country have been assaulted. And the reason being is because we have no sort of protection or barriers to actually ward off any type of attacks from any passengers. Now we're being attacked by an invisible enemy. I go to work every day afraid, not knowing. I go to work every day hoping that I don't bring this virus back home to my family. And the reason that I'm really afraid is the simple fact that I go to a stop every day not knowing who's going to be at that actual stop. I don't know who they've been in contact with. I don't know if they have the virus themselves. And the biggest fear for me while I'm driving, trying to pay attention to the road, is you'll have someone in the back either sneeze or cough. And if you've ever been on a city bus or public transportation, we look at it as a 40-foot incubator. You have no way of practicing social distancing on a coach. The way that the CDC has, has set up guidelines, there's no way for a bus to actually be able to have any sort of social distancing. They try their best the way that they've arranged the seating chart, 
but that never works because you still have people that are actually either coming out with no mask or they're just out riding the bus because it's just free. And most of the people that we're picking up are homeless people. We do have some essential workers where we have either the grocery store worker or we have the nurse that we're picking up to go to our major hospitals here. We have post office workers, but a lot of the times we have a lot of security officers that we are picking up. So those two are essential workers that I'm proud to say that I can go and make sure that they get from place to place. In Detroit, they've now started providing masks for the actual passengers. As the passengers enter through the rear door of the bus, they're actually able to take a mask. But me working in the inner city, we have a box of 50 masks that by the time I do a round trip, those masks are gone. So now I'm riding the bus all day long for eight, 10, nine hours a day that no masks are being provided for passengers that are actually getting on the coach. Now, personal protective equipment has been a constant, constant battle. Everyone is having those issues. And with me working with Detroit Department of Transportation, we never really had a plan in transportation to even work on or try to deal with a pandemic such as what we're going through right now. So everybody's struggling to get the actual PPEs. So it, it's really hard for us as transportation workers to know what to do. Um, we actually were finally able to get a hold of some N95 masks. And at that time, every driver was issued out one N95 mask. But in receiving those N95 masks, we were never told how to care for them, those N95 masks. So me, myself, personally, when I feel like I go out on my, my run for the day, I feel like that mask has been soiled. It's, it's contaminated. It's no more good for me. So I don't know what to do the next day. I never knew how to actually clean the mask to even be able to go on to the next day. So what I did personally and my wife, we actually did personally, we actually ordered N95 masks. And those masks were ordered in April. And we just recently, as two weeks ago, got that order of N95 masks. So that entire time, I've had to do makeshift masks from a bandana, which I know is not safe. I've had surgical masks. I've held on to my N95 mask that I was issued initially. But knowing that I've done that that whole entire time, it's had a great fear inside of me at that point, to the point where I was just afraid that I'm still going to bring home though that, that virus. And what I do actually, I come home from work, is I head directly to, the, to, to my washroom, take my uniform off, and I literally wash my uniform every single day just to make sure that I can get off whatever I, I've held on to for that entire day. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Coates. Uh, thank you so much for your testimony here today.